Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Hanging out today with Fred Kaplan. He's got his brand new book, The Bomb. This has been your life's work for a long time, my friend. How are you? Okay, thanks for having me on. So you've obviously studied this, written about it. What was it like putting this version of the book together and kind of deep diving into several presidencies and their nuclear strategies? Well, my very first book in 1983, which was called The Wizards of Armageddon, was about the small group of intellectuals who invented the concepts of nuclear war fighting, nuclear deterrence, that sort of thing. Uh, I got a lot of documents declassified back then. Mm -hmm. I interviewed about 160 people. But at the time, there was very little information out there about what the presidents themselves actually thought, said about nuclear weapons, nuclear war. Since then, as I discovered when doing the research for this book, there is a mountain load of documents on that sort of thing as well. And in the case of Presidents Kennedy and Nixon and Johnson, mm -hmm. tapes also. So this book is more about the actual decision makers, the actual decisions. What happened when different presidents were faced with crises in which they considered the use of nuclear weapons? And what kinds of thinking did they go through? What kinds of decisions did they make? What kinds of pressures they were under? So it's a, it's a different sort of book and it's, uh, you know, the subtitle is The Secret, Presidents, Generals, and the Secret History mm -hmm. of Nuclear War. Uh, a lot of this material has really never been out there before. Yeah, I think the personal decision making is pretty fascinating because you go all the way back to Kennedy and kind of being freaked out. And by Eisenhower. And, and Eisenhower Truman too. Truman as well. Yeah. yeah, and then all the way up to Trump and his very outlandish speaking about nuclear warfare. So what fascinated you the most just about, you know, any particular president in general, just about his relationship with nuclear warfare? Well, the, uh, to me, the, still the most fascinating and smartest president of them all was John Kennedy. He came into office believing there was a missile gap. Mm -hmm. The Russians were way ahead of us in missiles. This was in 1961. Uh, he was a hawk. He told the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the top generals and admirals, uh, in their first meeting that he was going to consult with them a lot, that he was going to take very seriously what they said. And in the course of his all too brief presidency, he turned around a lot. Very early on, it was discovered through satellite photos that there was no missile gap. Uh, he had a few crises over Laos, Berlin, and most famously, the Cuban mm. Missile Crisis, in which he realized, A, that his advisors, military and civilian, were not as smart as he thought they were. B, that any step that we took toward war with the Soviet Union was almost certain to escalate to nuclear war. And then he, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, tried to take steps to end the Cold War. And Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, uh, joined him in some of the steps. And then within a few months, Kennedy was assassinated. A year later, Khrushchev was ousted. And it was really only starting then in 1964 that the nuclear arms race really started going off on a tear. Yeah, I mean, this rivalry has been going on for decades. When you think back to the Soviet Union, even to present day Russia. Sure. What is it that we as a country have had such trouble with when it's come to Russia and that relationship? Well, you know, during the beginning of the Cold War, you know, going back to the even the 40s, but especially in the 50s, and as we developed nuclear weapons, the fear was that the Soviet Union would invade Western Europe or occupy the west part of Berlin. Uh, we didn't have much of a conventional army back then in Europe to deal with that. So the idea was, if you do this, we will destroy you with nuclear weapons. And by the way, destroy is not an overstatement. The nuclear war plan, the plan, say in 1960, mm -hmm. Uh, approved by the president and the Joint Chiefs and everybody was that if the Soviet Union or China invaded a, even a small part of the territory that was in our vital interest, we would unleash, unleash the entire nuclear arsenal against every target in the Soviet Union, China, even if China wasn't even part of the war, right. and the Eastern European nations, the satellite nations of the Warsaw Pact. Somebody asked well, how many people would get killed in this attack. It was 285 million people. Wow. I mean, it's beyond even, you, can't, you can beyond barely fathom this. It's beyond yeah. comprehension. Uh, and the notion that any war aim would be worth killing that many people. But see, then what happened? 
In the early 60s, the Soviets started to build their own nuclear arsenal. So this became a problem. Let's say they invade Western Europe. We strike them with all of our nuclear weapons. They could strike us with their nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So it's a suicide. It's a policy of suicide. And that's when uh, presidents, generals, strategists started to come up with ideas. Well, let's see if we can figure out a way what they called limited nuclear options. You know, maybe we could just fire a few nuclear weapons just at their military targets. And that would send them a signal that if they respond, they should restrict their response just to our military targets. We'll try to wind this thing down before everybody gets blown up. And in other words, the people who first talked about limited nuclear war were in a way trying to look for a more dovish way out of this thing. Mm -hmm. But nobody through all the decades could really figure this out, how to really do it. Would the Russians go along? Nobody knew. Could they go along if they, they wanted to? Probably not, especially back then. And the impulse toward escalation is something that, that everybody realizes is, is almost inevitable. Yeah, I think that's the craziest part about it is that everyone's still kind of trying to figure it out. So when you think about it, like you've lived through some of this, you've studied it, yeah. like who should we have feared the most when it comes to their relationship with nuclear weapons? Because it's one thing for Trump to talk about it, but it's another thing for the Cold War to be going on. Like which president was really the most pro-nuclear weapon when you think about it? Uh, well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, initially Reagan. Mm -hmm. Reagan, whom, whom I covered as a reporter, right. Uh, turns out to be a very fascinating character. During his first term, very anti-communist, mm -hmm. you know, as he had been all of his life, uh, boosted the nuclear weapons budget a lot, made extraordinary comments threatening Russia, <clears throat> and there were some activities going on too. Uh, planes crossing into Soviet borders, pl boats going up into Soviet harbors, very provocative. Then he realized in his second term that the Russians we're taking this very seriously, really thought we were about to launch a first strike, which he wasn't. In fact, the, 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 the interesting thing was Reagan was kind of a nuclear abolitionist. Mm. When he came up with this Star Wars plan, right. he might have been the only person who believed that it would, might really work, that the idea was to render nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. So what happened, so Mikhail Gorbachev finally becomes the Soviet premier, the first real reformer. Reagan decides to engage with them. We've got to tone this thing down. They meet in Geneva for their first summit in 1985. Uh, at, the, at first, the conversation, and these transcripts have all been declassified mm -hmm. now. The conversation was very tense. They go for a walk along the lake. They duck into a cabin where there's a fire blazing. And Reagan turns to Gorbachev and says, if the United States were attacked by aliens from outer space, <laughs> Would Russia come to our defense? When I read this, I'm like, this yeah. is insane. And Gorbachev says, absolutely. <laughs> and Reagan says, you know, I feel the same way about you. Hmm. And they walked out, and Secretary of State George Shaw, this was just the two of them and their translators, wow. walks in, back into the, to the convention center, hmm. and George Shultz, the Secretary of State, notices all of a sudden this complete change in atmosphere. They're laughing, they're joking, like they've been old buddies for years, and that, was the turning point where Reagan and Gorbachev really do try to wind down the arms race and end the Cold War. Hmm. That was a crazy story. I couldn't, couldn't believe that one when I read that Well, one. Reagan had this idea. I mean, you know, a couple years later, he said at a speech to the General Assembly, he goes, you know, if aliens attacked Earth, the squabbles and disputes that we have among ourselves he said here it wouldn't on this even planet compare, right? would, would be trivial. Yeah. And you know, in a way, let's think about this for a minute. I mean, in a way, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. On the other hand, hey, you know, there's there's kind of something to this. Sure. Maybe the best way to look at this is from a you know a billion miles up. Right. The top-down perspective. In which case, you say, yeah, you know, <laughs> hey, we're all humans. And uh, so, listen, there there are. Reagan and Gorbachev were both extremely unlikely figures to emerge in their respective countries. And yet the, the convergence of those two, uh, you know, it, 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 it did lead to a, an end to the Cold War, at least for a while.
I want to talk about some other presidents mm -hmm. that kind of got lost in the shuffle. Like Jimmy Carter, for example, you got a small section on him. It, it just seemed to me like didn't really know fully what was going on. It just seemed like a lot of chaos in the White House at that point. What piqued your interest about his relationship with news? Well, Carter, you know, he came into office. He was a very religious man, mm -hmm. and he was also a Navy man. Right. And Navy men like submarines under the city armed with missiles. They can't be tracked. Everything else is dangerous and provocative. Uh, he comes into to power wanting to eliminate nuclear weapons. At his first meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he says, how long will it take you guys to just cut our weapon, our, our land-based missiles from 1,000 to 200? Everybody looks around like, who is this guy? <laughs> uh, at the same time, he got into this stuff very much. There, there, there is a war game every year where you simulate you know, a nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some cabinet officer plays the president, Assistant secretaries play the various cabinet officers. Carter walks in, he plays himself. He's the first president, and I think nobody's ever done this, he was the first president to play himself wow. in one of these games. And when people told him that, he was stunned. <laughs> He's thinking, this is the most momentous thing that any president will ever do, and nobody until me has ever gone through the motions of what it would be. It. He also was the first president to bring his vice president, hmm. Walter Mondale, into this, which is also unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, if, the, you know, if they attack the White House, the president is killed, the vice president takes over, vice right? The vice president should know what's He's, going on, He right? should know what's going on, exactly. So he really gets into this. He plays two of these games. He also stages exercises. There's a whole procedure, emergency procedures, where if, if there's warning of an attack, a bunch of important people are supposed to get in a helicopter on the White House lawn and fly mm -hmm. out to some place. He staged an alert, like a Friday night at wow. 9 o'clock. Nobody, it's not enough time, nobody shows up, nobody can <laughs> even be reached. So they do several of these and people start to show up. And, and so even though he was very much against nuclear weapons, thought they were abominable, you know, morally horrible, uh, he took his responsibilities on this seriously. Mm. Well, in the same vein, when it comes to that, President Obama had a pretty interesting relationship with nuclear weapons because he didn't want any part of it, and people kind of had to convince him to stay in the game with it. So what was it like unpacking well, him? Well, Obama, again, very interesting. He comes, and he had studied this stuff in mm -hmm. school, unlike a lot of these other right. people. Uh, he comes into power, comes into office, and he gives a, a major speech saying that he wants to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in national security. And also, he wants in the long term to eliminate nuclear weapons. Maybe not in my lifetime, but we will take concrete steps toward the elimination of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. In one of his very early nuclear National Security Council meetings, he raises some policy issues. You know, it has been U.S. policy, a lot of people don't know this, from the beginning that we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons first. It's not just a retaliatory. In fact, for many years, that was plan 1A in the war plan, mm. that we go first, disarming nuclear first strike. He said, let's talk about whether we should uh, declare a no first use policy. And there was big discussions about it. And finally, Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense, said, well, look, you know, there are some countries that have biological weapons that they could put on their missiles. We gave up biological weapons a long right. time ago for a lot of reasons. Uh, shouldn't we reserve the right, just as a deterrent, to use nuclear weapons in response to a biological attack? And Obama had to say, yeah, you know, you're right. We, we, we really should. There were other discussions about sharply reducing the number of missiles that we have on land that are, that are vulnerable to a preemptive attack. And what happened there was that the START agreement, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, mm -hmm. was about to expire. It had been signed by George H.W. Bush. It was about to expire, and Obama had to replace it with what was called New START. And he didn't really think all this nuclear balance stuff meant much, but he was trying to reset relations with Russia, and this was going to be the centerpiece of it. And in order to get the Senate to ratify this treaty, which had to be by a two-thirds majority, mm -hmm. he had to agree to modernize all three legs of the nuclear triad, as mm -hmm. it's called, the land-based ICBMs, the submarine missiles, and the bombers. He had to sign on to that. He had to sign on to increasing the budget for nuclear weapons. 
And then once he signed on to this in principle, uh, the Republicans just took it for a long, long ride, well beyond what he would have approved. But someone told me that, uh, well, it was Ben Rhodes, who, who was one of his closest mm -hmm. aides, and who was more to the left of Obama on these issues, told some of his associates that, you know, Obama paints within the lines. In other words, he had, he had uh, lofty ideals, but in terms of day-to-day -day politics, he was very much a pragmatist, very much a centrist. I mean, people didn't, he, he tried to tell this to people all the time, they didn't he believe it. He got painted him. a different but, way, but, but that's but who he, he was. He, yeah. he really was. He, he, he didn't change the boundaries of what was really going on very much. Well, President Trump paints a little bit outside the lines when it comes to his day-to-day -day offices. And when you think about him, obviously he's talked a lot about this. Like, yes. if, you, if you could sit down with Trump, what would oh, you ask him about his nuclear strategy? <sighs> There is no strategy. I mean, there's nothing to talk about. You know, it's interesting. Reagan, who we all thought was kind of not really quite with yeah. it, when he met with Gorbachev in their later summit in Reykjavik, mm -hmm. Iceland, and note takers took notes. You can read them in Russian and English. Uh, they talked about this stuff for 10 hours in great detail. Wow. I mean, Reagan was thoroughly briefed on this stuff. He had some weird ideas about some things, but he understood the implications mm -hmm. of these ideas. You know, I can't imagine Trump having a conversation about this for 10 minutes. Mm. But here's the thing. So Trump, the reason why I wrote this book is because people all of a sudden became frightened about nuclear weapons. Yeah, he was talking about okay, it. Why? Yeah. Six months into his term, he comes out of a lawn of his golf course in New Jersey and says, uh, warns North Korea that he will rain fire and fury like the earth has never seen on North Korea, not if they attacked us, which would be, you know, something else. No, if they kept making threatening remarks about us and kept testing missiles and nuclear weapons. In other words, if they developed the capability to mm -hmm. attack us, he would rain fire and fury. Now, he wasn't just talking off the top of his head. I've discovered through interviewing a lot of people that there were very serious nuclear war plans right. going on about North Korea at his insistence. The, the nuke, we've always had nuclear war plans against, all, there have been contingency plans everywhere, the Pentagon. But this was the first time that a plan was made not to answer an attack, but to do a first strike mm. in response to a test, a provocative test. So this was real, it was rehearsed. Every time the North Koreans launched a missile test, and there were 15 of them that year, there was a conference call of all the four-star commanders, the same kind of conference call that would take place if, say, there was a warning of a Russian attack or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, General Mattis, who was Secretary of Defense, had the authority, the advance authority, if, if this North Korean missile test looked a little fishy, to launch, not nuclear, but short-range ballistic missiles, conventional, that were based in South Korea, at the North Korean test site, with the hopes of destroying the test site and maybe killing some of their leaders too. You know, Kim Jong-un liked to go watch some of these tests. Right. A couple occasions, he fired some of these missiles, not at North Korea, but out toward the Sea of Japan to fly in parallel with the North Korean missile. I mean, there were some very provocative things going on. This was, uh, this was a worked out war plan that uh, a lot of people in the military were frightened might actually take place wow. in their view was that if one of them told Trump in a briefing, Mr. President, don't take the first step unless you're ready to go all the way. Because a lot of the military people thought that there, there would be more than just the first step. Mm. Do you think we'll see nuclear warfare again in our lifetime? Well, here's the thing. You, you, it's, a, it's an interesting question. We haven't, nobody has used one of these in wartime since 1945. Right. Why is that? I think there are a few reasons. One, nuclear deterrence kind of works. You know, you blow up us, we'll blow up you. Mm -hmm. It kind of gives people hesitation. Even people who are in favor of total disarmament would acknowledge that we've probably missed a few wars, especially, say, between India and Pakistan. Yeah, definitely. Because they've had nuclear weapons and it deters things. But you know, this can't last forever. We've, I, I document in this book several occasions that were really near misses. And the reason why nothing happened then was a mix of very shrewd leaders who dug very deep into the logic of all of this, 
and decided, no, I do not want to go there, and found a way to scramble out of what the What was the closest hole. one, in your opinion? Well, I mean, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, yeah. certainly. And uh, think about the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, the Cubans had missiles in Cuba that could strike the United States, partly because we called their bluff on the missile gap. We realized they didn't have anything in the Russian and Soviet Union that could strike the United States. Uh, and Kennedy and his advisors sat around a table and talked for 13 days about what to do. On a Saturday, the last day of the crisis, Khrushchev presents a plan. Uh, I'll take out my missiles from Cuba. You take out your very similar missiles from Turkey. Kennedy says, this seems like a pretty fair trade. Everybody around the table, Same, whoa, whoa, whoa. not just the generals, yeah. Civilians too, Bobby Kennedy, Robert McNamara, mm -hmm. all these guys, no, this is a terrible idea, NATO will be destroyed, the Turks will feel betrayed, we, we'll lose all credibility. Uh, Kennedy says, that, that the plan was that on the following Monday, if this thing wasn't over, we were gonna start bombing the missile sites, I mean, the conventional weapons, but 500 air sorties a day, followed three days later by an invasion of Cuba. What nobody knew at the time was that some of these missiles had already been loaded with nuclear warheads. Wow. So the Russians had launched on, a t on warning, some cities would have been blown up. Two, the Russians had secretly deployed 40,000 troops on the island of Cuba to stave off an American invasion. In other words, if Kennedy had finally succumbed to all of his advisors mm -hmm. and said, yeah, you're right, this isn't a good idea, you know, let's go with the plan, we would have been at war wow. with the Soviet Union. A lot of good stuff in this book. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fred. Okay. Really appreciate it. Check out his book. It's a good one. For Fred, I'm DJ. See you next time. They're on the sit down.